Caitlin Burvey, welcome to the Rocky Mountain Writer Podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great to have you on. Um, anybody who goes to your YouTube channel, Ignited Ink Writing, knows that um, we could likely go for a half an hour on any one of those individual videos and the topics and things you bring up, and we will get into all the video production and things you do. Um, but we're chatting today because you are one of the masterclass presenters at Colorado Gold coming up in September, in addition to doing, I think, three other workshops. So you're going to be a busy uh, <laughs> woman that weekend. <laughs> but before we get into all that, just let's get to know you a little bit, if you don't mind. Can you sort of give us the story of how you, when, when did you start writing fiction and what was your initial kind of entryway into it? Definitely. So unlike a lot of authors, I did not grow up writing stories. I grew up a reader, but not a writer. And I thought I wanted to go to medical school. And at my college, you could take creative writing classes instead of general English class classes for those credits. So I was like, yeah, uh, let's do this. <laughs> Uh, and so that's how I started writing is was for college and just to get my credits. And I liked it enough that I did uh, take plenty of classes and I kept writing afterwards. Um, so then when I graduated from my college, got my biochemistry degree, I kept writing while I was working as a clinical allergy specialist, trying to get into medicine uh, during my lunch breaks and during the off season when we didn't have as many people coming in to treat allergies. I wrote a book and I was like, this is way more fun. Uh, I don't have to kind of deal with the insurance side of medicine, which I did a lot in that job. So I went to grad school and became an editor and a writer. So. Wow. Well, first of all, where did you go to undergrad? And then what what degree did you pursue on, in, uh, post, in your graduate work? I went to New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, had a lot of fun, and then took a I think three years off while I was figuring out what I wanted to do. And I went to Naropa in Boulder for my master's in creative writing. So I got my MFA. Is that what brought you to Colorado, Naropa? It is. Yes. Yeah. I moved for school and liked it. So I stayed. Wow. And just roughly how, how long ago was that? How long have you been writing since yeah, getting I that degree? Finished, I finished in 2017 is when I graduated. Okay. And it's a little weird at Naropa. So you do summer semesters as well as the spring and fall. So it's two years, but it's six semesters. So you're actually not done until halfway through 2017. It's not like May. Yeah. And give us an idea what Naropa is like. A lot of people don't know. Yeah, Naropa is different. So it is a Buddhist sort of school. It has a lot of that belief built into the program. But what's fun about it, if you are going for something like writing, is it's really relaxed and creative. So you have the space to try things out. It's a great program if you're an experimental writer in particular, if you like to play with form, if you are writing something that maybe doesn't fit into a specific box, they're really good for that. Uh, when I went, unfortunately, they didn't have as many fiction instructors. It just worked out that they had all left the semester before. So they were looking to hire new people. And that's what I write. So I wish that they had that figured out before my first year. But the second year was really good. So. That's great. Did you produce something out of that that became published? I did. So my collection, which is up on my wall, is When Magic Calls, a collection of modern fairy tales. And I did an independent study as a part of my master's program on fairy tales. And a part of that was writing these short stories for that class. And they ended up going into my book. That's great. Wow. So after doing that, how did you continue to pursue fiction? And did you? how soon did you also start the whole business around providing advice to writers? I started my business my last spring semester because I got a part-time job working for somebody else as a contract writer and they wanted me to have an LLC if I was going to be doing that. So I started my LLC before I was done with school and within about six months after graduation I realized that what I wanted to do didn't really exist at a company which is editing books, but also being able to edit other things and write content for other people. 
I like being able to do multiple things at a time and not just be stuck in one lane. And so within a year, I was making a full-time income just by freelancing. So I edit books. I was really lucky though. And I got a technical writing client where I actually made their YouTube help videos. We're going to talk about videos. And so one of my first clients was them and they were like my bread and butter for a few years because they needed me to go through all of their help and make these little five minute clips. And uh, then I just got to edit books on the side until that kind of built up too. Just out of curiosity, what industry was that help YouTube? In? What it is sort of a scheduling software company. They uh, are called mm-hmm. Schedule Source. And so if you are using that company for your employees and you go and are like, how do I do this? I'm the voice on the other side of those videos. <laughs> and I made all of the little arrows that point to <laughs> all of the things on the software. So did that give you some comfort in video production? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I had already been playing with the YouTube channel, but that was taught me how to use the editing software in a different way that has been really helpful. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. So if I can just summarize, it sounds like for a while there, it was, it was doing the technical writing for the YouTube channel, also editing books that Mm -hmm. would come your way projects and writing your own projects. Yes. Yeah. And it sounds like a lot, but the thing, if you're a book editor is it's very feast or famine. So you get like four books at a time or you have no books. (laughs) So you just write when it's the famine time of editing. Well, let's talk about the editing just for a minute or two. What kinds of books do you um, look for? Do you care? We read all genres Um, give us a rough idea how you set up a feed or read a book. Do you charge differently, I assume, for a developmental edit versus a line edit? Do you do line edits? I am one of the editors who does all of it. Some editors will get um, in one track and really like that. So they'll only do developmental or they'll only proofread. I do all of it, but I will not proofread something that I have developmentally edited because I've read it too many times. I'm not the right eyes for that. Yep. Uh, When I charge, it is based on word count or standard manuscript page. So for editing, it is for developmental editing, sorry, it's $7.50 per 250 words. If you want the full, we're going to go through the whole book multiple times. So I'm going to go through and read it, give you feedback, and then you're going to clean it up, take however long you need to, and we're going to give it back to me and we're going to do it all again. Uh, If you only want like one round, then it would be half that, which is 375. And so a copy edit, I do the 375 per standard manuscript page. Uh, Proofreading, I believe is 250. It's been a while since I've had to calculate the proofreading one. Uh, And I will though require to look at the manuscript before I'll do that math for you because I won't take a book that's not ready. So if you send it to me and I'm like, oh goodness, then what I will offer is something like, let's do one chapter. I'll give you a bunch of feedback that you can apply to the whole book. And I want you to go and do that, clean it up, then give it back to me before you're going to pay me to tell you the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Let's not do that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I will edit most things that are story-based. So most genres of fiction I really love fantasy is what I write, of course, any sort of speculative fiction, but growing up, my second love was mystery and horror. That's what I read a lot of in addition to those things. So I I really enjoy editing that. I've done some romance. I draw the line at certain types of content more than certain genres. Uh, I don't like to read super graphic rape scenes. So if you have that every other chapter, I'm not the editor for you. And then If you want me to copy edit something technical like a textbook or a business book or self-help, I can copy edit those. There are certain types of nonfiction that I won't developmentally edit because I don't have the knowledge to be the best person for that. Yeah. How much does all that help your own personal creative writing It definitely makes it so that I can be more critical of my own writing. I feel like I'm better at self-editing because I've looked at so many other things that way. 
I am in the process right now of self-editing the first book that I wrote, the one when I was uh, working as a clinical allergy specialist. And I hope to put it up on Kindle Vela, but I'm doing exactly what I would do if I was doing a developmentally developmental edit for another author. I'm yeah. going through and making those same notes, reading the whole thing. Going to go back and make some big changes before I'll have an yeah. editor friend copy edit it before I post it. But yeah. Is that book almost ready? And what's the title? Yes. Uh, the title is the hardest part in my head for the whole time I have been writing it. It has been called demon writer, but why it's called that doesn't happen to like the last chapter. <laughs> So it needs a, I think it needs a different title. I've been playing, but it might, it might stick. It might still be Demon Rider. It's a traditional medieval fantasy kind of leans towards YA um, plays with like, oh, we got to kidnap this person to take somebody else's place in a marriage themes. And then there's lots of magical creatures that pop up along the way. Uh, very, very kind of standard, a little bit different from my collection of fairy tales, which is kind of the opposite of standard. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just to make sure I heard you correctly, Demon Writer, W-R-I-T or R-I-D? R-I-D, Demon Writer. Uh, okay, yep, gotcha. Like yep. a horse. <laughs> just wanted to make sure. Because <laughs> yeah. Demon Writers, there, there are a lot of those around, you know. <laughs> yep. 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 Very cool. Wow. So you're you busy. You've got your hands full. And t tell us when did the whole Ignited, Ignited Ink writing world take off because I just want to quickly put in a plug. Um, maybe I'll put in the link. And as we're talking about it here, I'll put in the link on the YouTube, at least folks ought to go to your, your YouTube channel. You're going to be, you know, just amazed at the variety of content. And I don't know how many videos you have up there and some with thousands and thousands of views with advice on, um, well, everything under the sun, there's just really calmly laid out clear eyed advice on writing on marketing on on everything yeah i started that 2018 i believe is when i really started that channel and was consistent with it and those videos are based on blog posts that i do on my website as an editor and then i'll take that blog post and basically just say it as a video mm -hmm because people learn differently was my idea there. Some people like my boyfriend learns really well auditorial, auditory, auditorial, listening. yes. <laughs> he, uses, he uses his ears. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and so I wanted that also just more opportunities for people to find me, right? If I'm in more places and there's this concept in marketing where if you make it, use it as many ways and as many times as you can because you put in the effort. And so I started that in 2018 kind of as a way to advertise myself, but it also feeds my need to be a teacher. I love teaching. That's why I do the conferences. I just can't work in the academic environment that we currently have in our, yeah. In our society. I, yeah, but I love the teaching side. And so I get to do that through the YouTube channel and I get to do that through conferences and really editing is just one-on-one -on -one teaching. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, how did you come up with the whole production side of it? It just that blue screen and just deciding on a look and feel and just, you know, how you would um, project into the camera, the length of the video. So you, you, did you put a lot of thought into that or did that kind of evolve over time? Uh, that came from a lot of research, partly. I was researching, okay, what makes a good YouTube channel? What should be in the background? What's a good length of time? And this changes over time. When I first started, there was something that YouTube would do once your video hit the 10 minute mark and they would push it out more often. So that was a good length to shoot for for your videos when I started making them. Also, that's about as long, I think, as people are willing to sit and watch something like the type of video that I make where it's just me talking to the screen delivering information. I don't have a bunch of entertaining things happening on the screen. So I felt like 10 to 15 minutes was probably the maximum amount of time people were willing to sit through one video. So I shot for that 10 minute mark and then not to go too much longer. With the background, I picked that color because it comes from my logo. It's part of my branding. And uh, my boyfriend made me a 
a little like stand and that's uh, I think curtains is what they originally were that I could set up in my bedroom at the time and that's where I filmed uh, and then I looked up things like you need good lighting uh, you need to be consistent so if you're going to pick a background stick with that for a while I've moved since I filmed my last video so I have to figure out where in this new space I can film and have it be the same quality and so yeah. I yeah I thought about all of that yeah wow it's quite robust I must say it's a robust channel there's a lot of stuff out there, but yours is just very easy to navigate and poke around. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So video kind of leads us into, uh, at least I think it does, your master class, uh, which is titled Smile. You don't have to be on camera, which I might think after that last bit that you do have to be on camera. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about the master class. Have you taught this class before? I have, I've taught two versions of this in an hour and very quickly realized that we need more than an hour to go over what I wanted to go over in this. Uh, I feel like a lot of authors are new to video. So I feel the need to cover some basics as well as just diving into, okay, what can you do as an author with video? And the smile, you don't have to be on camera is also a nod to like, not a lot of authors want to be on camera. They want to feature yeah. their books, the thing that they made. They don't want to feature themselves. And there are ways that you can do that. So. Yeah. Well, let's give a little uh, kind of a tease about some of the things you're going to suggest without giving too much away. Just, And this is a three-hour class now or master class is four? Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. it's at least three hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll look it up while you start giving us a, a little detail on what you're going to cover and is it for somebody who's camera shy or is it for somebody who's camera hungry yeah so I try to kind of provide information that'll help both of those people so the first thing we're going to go over in the class is just basics essentially you can use your phone which is what I film my YouTube channels on it's what I use for my TikToks your phone has a great camera technology has come a long way so we talk about that different ways you can do that, basics like lighting and sound quality, things a lot of that nature. And then we will shift into the author specific side. And this is where that title comes in. And we're gonna talk about the different types of videos you can make that will help market your books. And we will have one section that is videos where you don't have to be on screen. It's your book that's on screen. What's been really popular on TikTok for a while is you film, your book pages just flipping really quickly. And then you yeah. put words over that that are a teaser or a scene from your book. And we'll talk about how you can make those. Those do really well. Then we'll talk about ones where you are on camera, how to talk about your book on camera, how you can play and hop on trends and expose your book that way where you don't have to actually talk. Maybe you're lip syncing. Maybe you're uh, playing with, a trend and you're making it so that it works for your book. There was one trend two years ago, I believe on TikTok, where it was a sound and people were dropping clothes on the floor. And then at the end, they would stomp their foot and they'd be wearing that outfit that they just dropped. Right. 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 Well, I did right. that with my book. I dropped a notebook and pens and then I dropped printed out pages of my book. And then at the end, I dropped my book. And one thing that's really important, though, if you are going to dive into this world of book marketing through video, you got to have a great cover. They say that your cover sells your book. I won an award for my cover. I'm happy with it. I'm not saying it's the best one ever. But if you don't feel like your cover should win an award, go back to the drawing board, make them work on it more. Uh, it's worth it. It's going to be what sells your book. I get all the time people are like, I love your cover. What's your book about? And if they didn't yeah. love my cover, they wouldn't ask. So that's going to be really important if you're video marketing, because if you don't want to be on camera, or even if you do, it's going to be all about that book cover. Yeah. yeah. That, then just getting to know those production details, like how to, you know, the, the clothing example you, you mentioned, and the book example yours, sometimes there's dozens and dozens of edits within one 30 second TikTok. They're so clever and so fast moving, but they require some patience at least to get used to how to editing edit with that 
with that app. It's they not- do. Yeah. 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 I would say too. So I do a lot of my stuff in the TikTok app itself. You can do a lot of editing in there. When you see the really crazy transitions, like somebody falls under their bed and then suddenly they're falling into water. A lot of those use software beyond what TikTok offers. Uh, But in my class, we're going to cover what TikTok does and what your other free editing programs are going to offer, because I'm going to assume that's what most people are going to start with. Also, it's not too complicated, so it's pretty easy to get started there. Like the clothing drop one, for me, that was just hitting pause on time. I just had to learn how to do that. And then TikTok added a feature where you can tell it how long to record and then it'll stop and then you can move it around right and get ready for the next shot and tell it how long to record for the next one that was super helpful when they started doing that oh well are you a tiktok person or is that mainly where you put your emphasis because that world is crazy with books it is yes so that is a great place to hop in if you're like i don't know what social media to use for my book TikTok is the hot place right now. There's a whole sub culture called book talk. Right. And it's just all the people who love books. They talk about books. It's authors, it's readers, it's different people in the publishing industry. And uh, some, some, some of them are just, the, you can't even believe the volume of books that they're reading in a month, how, yes. you know, they're, they're promoting, they're putting up a video a day talking about different books. I mean, the, yes, there are calm TikTokers, I like to think of myself as a calm TikToker, just sort of not getting too wild and crazy, but you just get the feeling like everybody reads books and they probably read three a day, you know, sometimes. Yeah, you do. You do. And certain readers have always been voracious like that. And the Kindle program where they can subscribe and get as many as they want in a month, that has just made them read even more. Yeah. Yep. But it, it can be a little daunting at first. You feel like, how am I ever going to have a voice in this world? Um, yeah. What what is, what is your TikTok handle? Do you know it off the top of your head? Yeah, it's just my name, Caitlin Burvey. Okay. Uh, okay. I didn't put author or anything like that because I wasn't sure what the channel would be when I made it. But, right, right. Yeah. And do you do you promote your YouTubes on there? I do. I do some cross promotion. And then two, I repost my favorite TikToks to my other social media, like Facebook or Instagram, even Twitter. The reason I do TikTok too is that that video editing and recording is so user-friendly now uh, that it's easy to record in TikTok intending to download that video and put it somewhere else. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So that's helpful. But I put it, I kind of cross do everything. Yeah. Do you set aside certain time every day to work on social media? Is it a set thing or do you go in and out all day long? I know I am the type of person, TikTok is the only social media that gets me. I will doom scroll as they call it on TikTok. And I don't do that (laughs) anywhere else because none of the other ones get me like that. So I don't, I have a timer that goes off at 3 PM for when to remind me to put my TikTok video up. And then I use a scheduling software for everything else, even YouTube, I schedule when it gets released. And so then I do that schedule about once a month for all of the other platforms. And I usually set aside a filming day once or twice a month for TikTok. Same thing with my YouTube channel. I did take a break from my YouTube for about six months. Uh, Same thing with my blogs. I got really busy with paid work. Uh, and I am working my way back into that. It's just not going to be every week that I'll be able to post something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very good. Well, getting back to the master class real quick, what should uh, people bring to the master class? And by the way, I looked it up. It is Friday from eight to eight to noon. So okay. it's in the morning. It's four, four hour class. And you go to the conference page, you, you register for the conference, and then it's a separate engagement to sign up for the master class. Yes. So always bring to any class like this, of course, your favorite way to take notes. So whether that's a notebook and a pen or a computer, whatever you like, because any of my programs, I have little prompts built in 
or I'm like, okay, we just talked about this thing. Now I want you to take five minutes and think of some ways that this could apply specifically for you and how you can apply it to whatever you're working on. So in the masterclass, I might talk about the different places you can post videos. And then I might say, okay, take a couple minutes, think about which social media platform you already use. Can you apply what we're learning to this? Or are you brand new? Think through all of them, which one might you wanna start with? Uh, so notes and things for that. And then we are actually going to make videos in my class. So after we go through everything, you'll wanna have your phone or some sort of a camera with you. And I will let you all run around, find a place, film a little video. Anyone who's comfortable will throw it up on the screen and we'll talk about it. Uh, basically, kind of how this is gonna work in the book world and how maybe we can make some adjustments to make it even better, but mostly it'll just be getting to see everybody's ideas. If you really want to hop into the video creation world, watch more videos about books. And yeah. It'll give you more ideas for what you should do for your channel. And the one thing I would say, this is my own personal opinion, feel free to disagree if you do, but you know, at some point you really have to be yourself mm -hmm. on there. You, you, if, if doing all the crazy goofy stuff isn't really for you, of course, maybe I'm just kind of defending my own style here and how I do it. But I, you know, I just think in any social media and any um, manifestation of yourself online has to be within the bounds of who you are as a person, because you can't show up at a conference or at a bookstore selling books and be some completely different person. You need to be yourself. And if you want to get a little creative, sure. But you don't, when you see some absolutely wacky, bizarre, highly edited video on TikTok that's only 35 seconds and wows you, doesn't mean you have to go through all those same steps. No, it doesn't. And the other thing to remember too, one of the reasons I love TikTok and what it's done for the video world is TikTok has made it so that it is totally fine to just film a quick video in your car. Yeah, and that right. is all the production yeah. value you need. Just make sure like the sun is shining on you yeah. sort of a thing. Or you can go all out. If you love video and you love the editing, you can do like the crazy transitions where people hold up mask after mask after mask. And it's like something new every, I don't know, quarter of a second or something crazy. You can do that too. Yeah. But you do whatever works best for you. And TikTok has made it acceptable to like learn as you go. So you just make your first video. It's the best you can do at that time. And that's fine. That that works. And then as you get better and better, great. Yeah. That works too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Good points. Excellent. Well, let's just quickly mention your three other workshops, at least the ones I found on the yes. schedule. Bir Birds of a Feather. How to Write Diverse Characters and Secret Life of Fairy Tales. Um, so folks should look for you at the conference teaching yes. those as well. So Birds but, of a Feather will be fantasy. It is discussion-based where you can all come and we'll chat, we'll answer questions. There'll be other fantasy authors in there with me. Um, diverse Characters, I'm from New Mexico. I was actually really uncomfortable when I first moved to Boulder because there was too many white people <laughs> and there was nobody else there. So uh, we're going to talk about ways you can be respectful and write people who might be different from you so that you can have a diverse cast. And then the Secret Life of Fairy Tales will go through kind of the history of fairy tales and their evolution, why they're still so popular, why are we still telling the same stories from forever ago, and how you can apply that to your writing. So, yeah. Great, great. Excellent. Well, like I said at the beginning, you're going to be um, have a pretty full schedule. Um, for yeah. the weekend, you're, you'll get a break maybe here and there, but I'm sure you'll feel <laughs> pretty exhausted at the end of it. Um, and for those who know um, from previous conferences, you also um, put some effort into what you're wearing during the Yes. Conference. And so do you already have that all planned out? I do. I have my Red Riding Hood cloak that I usually bring every time I do a fairy tale something. Um, if you go to my TikTok, you'll see that I do some cosplay, just stuff in costume, because that's like my personality, right? I love that stuff. It's fantasy. Um, I don't know. Otherwise, is there a theme dinner at this conference? 
I this think not a it, year. if anything, it's just around that 40th anniversary of the yeah. RMFW. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So very cool. But I do think about it before we get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's obvious. You probably have a bigger suitcase than most. That's my <laughs> prediction. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Well, as we wrap up here, we always like to give a recommendation for a book or a writer, uh, something you just want to pay it forward a little bit and highlight. So now's your chance. Yeah. At a conference about a year ago, I picked up a book called Lost on a Page. It is by, I have his name up here, David E. Sharp. Super fun if you're a writer. I highly recommend it because the premise of the book is Writers are writing these characters. They realize their characters in a book. And as soon as they realize that, they gain autonomy and start to try to get out into the world where books are written. And now the writers are no longer in control. Super fun. It goes through books from lots of different genres, which also makes it really fun. So you'll probably find your genre in here. And if you're the type of writer who doesn't want to be stuck in a genre box, this is something you can do. You can just stick them all in one book. So it's a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. That's great. Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for your time today. Um, good luck with all your endeavors and we'll see you at Colorado Gold in uh, September. Yeah, I'm excited to go. Do you enjoy reading multiple genres or do you have a favorite, but from time to time you enjoy another handful? then you should check out Lost on the Page by David E. Sharp. This book is so much fun, especially if you like multiple genres, because the premise is characters that are being written by writers have realized they are characters in books. And when they have that realization, they gain autonomy and can now change their stories and hop from story to story. So in this book, David writes a romance novel. He writes a sci-fi one. He, his main character is a CD noir detective. It is so much fun, especially for people who like to read different genres. So I highly recommend this one if that's what you enjoy, and if you like just a good old-fashioned adventure story. Mm -hmm.